Mic test, one, two, three, mic test. Mic test, one, two, three. We will begin in uh, a couple of minutes. Okay, it's 7.31, so uh, we will begin. Welcome to EM Living Life, uh, session 10, the Great Commission. So before we begin, uh, let me pray, and then we'll get right to it. <coughs> Father in heaven, we thank you for this time uh, where we look in, uh, look at the Word of God and learn about uh, the Christian life. Father, may we not take the word basic uh, for granted, but may we take them to heart, all these basic doctrines uh, that you have given us, O oh Lord, that we might grow and be strengthened. So Father, as we 
Now bring all the things that we learned thus far and bring it to focus in terms of the mission of the church. Help us, Father, to understand what it means to be the church and what we are supposed to be doing as the church of Jesus Christ. Father, give us uh, that clarity of thought, of mind, and may our conviction as, um, as to the mission of the church be uh, strengthened among us tonight. Father, we thank you, and it's in Jesus' name <laughs> we pray. Amen. Okay, so... <clears throat> The Great Commission, or the mission of the church. Now we are, this is the 10th week, so we have just a few more uh, lessons left. But <coughs> I want you to notice that this is the flow. We hear the good news, the story of the universe, the story of the world, and we repent and believe, and we follow Jesus as we do, we grow in our knowledge of the one who saved us, who uh, called us to himself, the triune God. And we learn that out of the three persons within the Godhead, the blessed Godhead, it is the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, who took on human flesh, came into the world, and accomplished our redemption. And as he ascended into heaven, he now sent us the Holy Spirit who now indwells us, so that we can grow as a disciple of the Lord, as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, as the church. And all of that we learn from the Bible. And all these things, the first six things, we take all these things and we live them out in the context of the church, the local church. The initiation, right, into the body of Christ the church is baptism, as Jesus commands. That is the first thing that we do. And these two things are really practical outworkings of what it means to be the church. We are baptized into the church, and we become a member of the church. We submit to the leadership, and the leaders, God-ordained leaders, then shepherd us. And this is how we live the Christian life for the rest of our lives, We, as a member of the body of Christ. And now, now that we are made members of the body of Christ in the local church, the question that we have to ask is, what do we do in church? Of course, we come, we worship, we pray, we study the Bible, we fellowship, and all those things are good things. And we do community services, serve, serve the poor. All those things are good things, and the church does them. But what is the main mission of the church? Not just this particular local, local church, but if you bear the name of Jesus Christ, if you say this is the church of Jesus Christ, what does Jesus say is your main responsibility, the main mission of the church? Now, that's what we want to talk about tonight, the mission of the church, or the Great Commission. As you can see, it's part one, so I'm not going to go into uh, the details of the mission itself, but I want to identify what uh, the mission is and how we get there. <coughs> so, if you have the study guide, you can download online. We'll be looking at um, four questions. What is mission? First of all, what is a mission? <coughs> Because we're talking about the mission of the church. Now, don't confuse that with missions, cross-cultural uh, endeavor where we go and plant churches among the UPGs. That's missions, just generic sense of the word, mission. What is a mission? Mission of the church. Now, this is important because there is so much work to do. And unless we're clear about our mission, then all the efforts and the resources will be wasted. And church will just turn into just another social club dressed in a religious garb. And so we need to know what the mission really is. We need to be uh, focused. We need to understand what it is. And 
I'm going to argue tonight that the traditional answer, the Great Commission in Matthew 28, is still the best place to turn to when we want to understand the mission of the church. So, first of all, let me begin this way. Why does this matter? Defining, you know, defining the term, defining mission. Why, do, why does it matter? Because I have a quote here by Stephen Neal. He said, if everything is mission, nothing is mission. And you can replace the word mission with pretty much any other word. If everything is worship, as people say, then nothing is worship. If everything is, I don't know, if you, you fill in the term. In other words, when everything becomes just one, when you reduce everything into that one particular term, then it's going to get imprecise and you will lose focus. As well intended as it may sound, you're going to be scattered, ineffective, not focused. So we need to have a precise understanding of our mission because we live in a world of finite resources and a limited time, which means we have to be effective. We need to be focused, intentional, deliberate. And not everything God calls us to do is the mission of the church. They may be good things that we need to be doing, uh, good things that we could do, but not every good thing is a mission of the church. If everything is mission, then we're bound to lose focus again. If everything is part of the mission, then realistically, practically, we cannot go at that pace. We will be ineffective and lose focus, and in the end, we'll just burn ourselves out, not knowing what it was that we were supposed to accomplish in the first place. So what is mission? I have this uh, very precise and concise definition by David Bosch, a well-respected missiologist. He says, in the study guide, you have it with you, a mission presupposes a sender, a person or persons sent by the sender, and those to whom one is sent, and an assignment. You see that? A mission presupposes a sender, a person or person sent by the sender, those to whom one is sent, and an assignment. So four elements in a mission. The one who sends, four elements, four basic elements. One who sends, and one who is sent and to whom you are sent and a task, a specific task, an assignment. Now those are four essential elements when it comes to a mission. Doesn't have to be a church, any organization. One mission, okay. One who sends. One who is sent and to those whom you are sent with a specific task. Now, if that's the general definition of the word mission, now you plug that into the church, the identity of the church. What is the mission of the church then? The one who sends us is who? Jesus. The one who is sent is us, the church. <coughs> to whom are you sent? Jesus sends us into the world with a specific task. And we'll talk about it later. So if that's a mission, now this helps us to clarify, to understand the mission of the church. Because that means it's a specific task. The mission of the church is a specific task that Jesus has given to the church, not to the entire humanity on earth. The specific task that Jesus has given to the church only, and it needs to be accomplished on earth, not in heaven. In other words, this mission has a time frame. It has a deadline. It's not an eternal thing. Because the one to whom we are sent is the world, which is perishing and will pass away. 
there's a deadline. This is something, a specific task that Jesus has given to the church, not everybody in the world, that we must accomplish in this particular world, on earth, not in heaven. Now, under that definition, some things are ruled out. Some things that we might confuse as the mission of the church. For example, the greatest commandment. The greatest commandment or the purpose. We cannot confuse the purpose with mission. Okay? Purpose is not the mission. What is the purpose, the ultimate purpose of the Christian or the church? It is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Or you might say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. All, that's the purpose. Because that doesn't have a deadline. It's an eternal goal, eternal purpose. That is the end of all things. That is the end for which all things are created. So we will do that forever in heaven and here down below too. That is the ultimate purpose that drives the mission because mission is something specific that is limited on earth. The greatest, com the greatest commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to, gl to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever, that cannot be the mission because mission is something that he, we have to accomplish specifically on earth with finite resources and a limited time. So unless we are clear about defining the term, again, we will be wasting a lot of time and resources, and we need to be focused. Now, if that's the mission, with that uh, preliminary definition, we want to know then, I'm going to argue, as the church has always argued for the last 2,000 years, that under that definition still, the Great Commission in Matthew 28, Great Commission is still the best place to turn. Why? Why the Great Commission? Because we have some other uh, competing passages that are good candidates for the mission of the church. A lot of people point to some of these uh, verses in the Bible. For example, uh, Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Let's turn to Genesis 12, 1 to 3. This is very famous. God's promise to Abraham a worldwide blessing. <coughs> Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So here God is giving Abram this worldwide blessing through one person, Abraham. So this is just an amazing verse. This will recur over and over again throughout the Bible, one of the foundational verses. So a lot of people say, you know, that could be a great mission statement of the church to be a worldwide blessing. Or, other people point to Exodus 19.6. If you turn to Exodus 19.6, this is God's, where God renews that promise given to Abraham, but this time God gives that, God extends that promise, not just through one person, Abraham, but through the entire nation of Israel. <coughs> So this, uh, God says, if you just pick up from uh, verse 3, they're in the wilderness, encamped before the mountain. Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So this is what an expansion, an extension of 
Abraham's promise. Abraham, I'm going to bless you, make you a channel of blessing for all the families of the earth, but now God says, I'm going to do it through you, the nation of Israel. So a lot of people point to this and say, you know, this could be a, a very good mission statement of the church. You be a worldwide blessing. You, not just an individual, but the body of Christ. And Apostle Peter picks this up even in 1 Peter 2, 9, <coughs> where he says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It's a great passage. Or, when it comes to the New Testament, some other people point to, hey, what about Luke 4, 18 and 19? That's a great mission statement. Jesus, this is his preaching when he began his ministry, and he is talking about the fulfillment of Isaiah 61. He opens the scroll in Isaiah, sits down, and he reads in Luke 4, 18, 19, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now that sounds great. That sounds like a great mission statement. It sounds like a holistic mission statement even. There's the physical, the psychological, social, spiritual, everything. Great mission statement. So with all these good alternative texts. Why has the church almost unanimously went to Matthew 28, the Great Commission, the so-called Great Commission, as the passage that sums up the mission of the church? It has been virtually unanimous. Why? Because there are some great reasons, obviously. Let's look at them one by one. So I'm going to build this case here, if you turn to page two. <coughs> First of all, when it comes to the mission of the church, the New Testament is a better place to turn to than the Old Testament. The New Testament is a lot better to turn to than the Old Testament. Why? A couple of reasons. Now, from in Genesis 12, 3, we saw that Jesus and God says, I will bless those who bless you, and you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So from the beginning, we know, of course, that God meant to bless all nations, not just Israel. So the plan all along was to bless all the families of God, all the nations, through Israel. We get it. We understand that. But even so... <coughs> The Old Testament primarily concerned with preparing Israel to that end. It was a preparation. How do we know? Because in Matthew 15, 24, Jesus says to the Syrophoenician woman, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. So even in Jesus' ministry, a full-fledged Gentile mission, a worldwide global mission, was something in the future, after his death and resurrection. So all the time before that, even in the Old Testament, while there was promise of a worldwide blessing to the Gentiles, it was still preparing the nation of Israel to that end. So the whole missionary idea in the Old Testament was centripetal, as they say. Come and see. You come to the center. Come and see. We are the chosen people. God dwells among us. All the nations, you come and see. Centripetal. That was the missionary force in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, it's go and tell. Centrifugal. You go and tell. Because this is the age of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ died upon the cross. He rose again, torn, 
has torn the veil. The temple structure became obsolete. Now, Jesus says, all along it was come and see the great God of Israel. But now, the temple has been made obsolete. Jesus is the temple. And this is the house of God for all the nations. Now go and tell this good news. Spirit of the age is dawned. So it makes perfect sense that when, we, when it comes to the mission of the church, that we would turn to the New Testament rather than to the Old Testament. In Galatians 6, 16, Paul calls Christians, the church, the new Israel of God. So that's one evidence that we're building here. The second point, or point three here, even within the New Testament, it makes sense to look to Jesus himself for the mission. So we are, we narrow it down to the four Gospels. Within the New Testament, it makes sense to look to Jesus himself for the mission of the church. Because if you turn to John 20, 21, John 20, 21, we have the supreme mission in the Bible. The Father sends the Son. 20, 21, it says, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. The Father sends Jesus. This is the supreme mission in the Bible. So Jesus came with a specific mission to accomplish and he tells us what that is. If you, if you go back to John 4.34. So we are making, make those connections in your head. John 20.21, 20, the supreme mission of the Bible, the Father sends the Son. John 4.34, Jesus says, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. So right there we know that Jesus came with a, spe a specific mission to accomplish, sent by the Father. The Father sends the Son. The Son is the one who is sent. He is sent into the world to accomplish a specific work. He came to do the will of Him who sent me. What is the will of the Father? What is that will? John 6.39, Jesus says, if you turn... One more chapter, John 6, 39. Jesus says, This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. And then he will go on and say, Everyone who looks on the Son and believes him should have eternal life. See that, that 40, right? This is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. So what is Jesus saying? When you just look at these three verses together, Jesus is saying, just as my Father has sent me into the world with a specific mission, so I too am sending you, the church, into the world. Now that's, that much is clear deduction from these verses. Father sent the Son. The Son says, I've come to do the will of my Father who sent me here. And the will of my Father is that whoever turns to me shall be saved. And he says, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Now, if that's true, and it is, we clearly see, then it makes perfect sense that Jesus would tell the church, tell us what our mission is what our mission is to do in this world. If there was no specific mission, then why would Jesus take us out of the world and send us back into it and says, I'm sending you back into it just as the Father has sent me? Obviously, Jesus is the one sending us back into the world with a mission. So we would turn to Jesus, expecting that he will tell us what it is that he expects us to do in this world. See, it makes perfect sense that we look to Jesus himself for the mission of the church. And that narrows down to the four Gospels. Okay, so among the four Gospels, big point number four, <coughs> why turn to the Great Commission? 
because of the strategic importance of the Great Commission. The strategic importance of the Great Commission. Most basically, commonsensically, the words of the last words of a person carries special weight. So you could say, you know, the Great Commission, or this is the last word uh, that Jesus gave to the church before he ascended to heaven. Now that's going to get your attention. That's something special. But that's commonsensical. But the biblical evidence goes deeper than that. If you go to Matthew 28, the Great Commission, let's read the Great Commission. We haven't read it because we're so familiar, but let's remind ourselves. If I read from so 18 through 20, Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of age. End of the age. So, these are his last words, final words after the resurrection and before the ascension. So this is a climactic moment. And even though Jesus is the Son of God, he lived his entire life as a suffering servant. I mean, Jesus has just resurrected. But all 33 years of life, he lived as a suffering servant. He, was, he came and he suffered and died. He was despised, rejected, even forsaken by the Father. But not anymore. He is now risen in glorious body. And never again will the Son of God be so dishonored and humiliated. Never again. He has defeated death and as the risen Lord of all, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And that's really going back to Daniel 7.14. All authority has been given to that Son of Man. And just before he ascends to heaven and sits down at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, to reign as the King of all kings and Lord of lords, he turns to his disciples and gives them one last command. Make disciples of all nations, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now that sounds pretty important. Let's add a few things, though. That, I mean, that itself is very important, but... Look at the way that Matthew intentionally sets up the Great Commission. And I think uh, we talked about this before Sunday sermon, but I want you to notice this again. <coughs> if you look at chapter 28, verse 10, you can really skip verses 11 through 15, and it just makes a smoother reading. And the reason why Matthew inserts 11 through 15. We talked about it about six months ago when we looked at the Great Commission on Sunday Sermon. But just read from verse 10. Skip to 16 and how just it just flows. Then Jesus said to them, verse 10, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. You see, it just flows. But here, notice, in verse 10, Jesus says, Tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. <coughs> now, where are they now? They're in Jerusalem. So Galilee is about 100 miles away. So why can't Jesus just see them in Jerusalem. They're all there. He's there. Why does he say, we're all going to go up to Galilee, 100 miles from here? Why make them walk 100 miles to Galilee? Because in verse 16, 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. So Jesus says, we, I have to see you on that particular mountain in Galilee. I can't just see you anywhere. Isn't that interesting? You see, in the Bible, mountains matter. 
They're symbolically very significant. <coughs> Mountains in the Old Testament are places <coughs> where God dwells, where God shows up. For example, Sinai, that's the mountain of God. And so the tabernacle itself was modeled after Sinai. Because the Israelites, they couldn't take Mount Sinai whenever they wandered. You cannot take the mountain with you, so they made a portable Mount Sinai, as it were. That was the tabernacle. Mountains. Dwelling of God. That's where people meet God. So in Matthew, even in Matthew, uh, written for Jewish audience, a uh, great deal happens on mountains. Like in chapter 4, temptation. Satan brings Jesus to a very high mountain to tempt him. And the Sermon on the Mount, it happens on, on the mountain. That's chapter 5. Mount of Transfiguration, chapter 17. That happens on the mountain. The final discourse on Mount of Olives, chapter 24. And now, for one last time, we have another mountain in Galilee, in chapter 28, the Great Commission. But what's interesting is, <coughs> in Matthew 28, Galilee and mountain, they show up together. But there's one other place that those two words show up together in Matthew, and that's Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus first began his ministry. So if you go back to chapter 4, This is after the temptation. 4.15, Jesus begins his ministry <coughs> in fulfillment of prophet Isaiah. 15 says, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. And Jesus begins to minister. And then immediately, 5.1, the Sermon on the Mount picks up. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. When he sat down, disciples came to him and he taught the Sermon on the Mount. So that's how Jesus begins his ministry. And interestingly, it says, Galilee of the Gentiles. Isn't that interesting? That's a small hint that even as Jesus begins his ministry, he had global missions in mind. That's not a full-fledged uh, indication, but it is something. But if Jesus began his ministry with a hint of global missions in mind, as he ends his ministry in, in Matthew 28, he doesn't just hint, but he explicitly commands bringing the light to all nations. Go and make disciples of all nations. So the Great Commission in Matthew 28 is really summing up in a nice sandwich what his all the focus of his ministry. He began Galilee, mountain, hinting at global missions, but now he ends wrapping up with this. He, and he brings to full light, bringing light to the Gentiles, all the nations. It's strategically placed, the Great Commission. That's why he says, come meet me in the mountain in Galilee, 100 miles from here. I need to tell you something there. Where I began, and now I will finish. But moving on, <coughs> so that was the location, the strategic importance of the Great Commission, 4A, its location, but also 4B. The Great Commission is not just strategically placed, but it sums up the major themes of the Gospels. It sums up all the major themes of the Gospels. Now, this is true for all four Gospels, but especially in Mark, uh <coughs> 
the major emphasis in Mark, now this is true of all the Gospels, but is discipleship and the call to follow Jesus. Jesus is the Lord. He's the Son of God, the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the emphasis of the first half of the Gospels. Who is Jesus? It's the Gospel writers proving over and over again through many uh, different ways, his teachings and healings and miracles. Jesus is the one. He is the Son of God. And therefore, how should you respond to him? What does it mean to follow him? So discipleship is a major theme in the Gospels. But that discipleship, the call to discipleship, is always grounded on the authority of Jesus. He has to prove himself to you. I am worthy of, of your discipleship to, to be, for you to follow me. And the way that the gospel writers portray that authority is that Jesus has the authority over demons, diseases, nature. He has the authority to teach. Even over sin, he can forgive, over death. So in the Gospel of Mark alone, some 18 miracles show up when you add up the count, about 18 miracles, but 15 of them are concentrated in the first half of Mark. Every chapter contains a miracle because the point is Mark is demonstrating to the readers that Jesus is the one who has authority. He is the Son of God. And therefore, the theme of discipleship runs underneath. If that's who Jesus is, what does it mean to follow him? How should you follow him? See, those, thi those two things are big themes, his authority and discipleship. And it's no surprise that, therefore, at the end of the Great Commission, the Great Commission stresses those two things, those two things precisely. The authority of Jesus. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, the call to discipleship. Make disciples of all nations. Authority, discipleship. So here's David Bosch, who says, and you see this in the study guide, today scholars agree that the entire gospel points to these final verses all the threads woven in the fabric of Matthew from chapter 1 onward draw together here. You see, the Great Commission is not just strategically placed, but it sums up the major themes of the Gospels. And also, next point, everything in Acts and the rest of the New Testament, 4C, flow from it. So if everything in the Gospels converge in the Great Commission, then everything in Acts and the rest of the New Testament flow from it, from the Great Commission. <coughs> because the rest of the New Testament, think about it, Acts and letters, are all those things are about how the apostles obeyed this call to discipleship, and they went to the ends of the earth proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ and making disciples of all nations. That's what they did. Everything points to the Great Commission. All the major themes in the Gospels are converging in the Great Commission. And out of the Great Commission flows the rest of the New Testament. So the Great Commission is not just random parting words of Jesus Christ, but it actually holds the entire story together. Everything before points to it, and everything after flows from it. And that's why, since the earliest days of the church, in the early church, people have been looking to this particular passage, the Great Commission, as the mission of the church. This is the mission of the church, given to us by Jesus Christ himself. This is beautifully and concisely summed up right here, the mission of the church. <laughs> now, all these things are <laughs> very important for us to learn because it's one thing to just assert, make disciples of all nations. These are the last words of Jesus. That's why we need to do it. That's not going to carry you very far. If you're not really convinced from the Bible, why is this the mission of the church? When you meet, you know, when you meet opposition 
and difficulty and persecution. And people will come, come to you and say, you know, if the church is to survive in this changing world, then you need to change your mission because you're being irrelevant. No one's going to listen to you. See, unless you are biblically convinced that this is the mission of the church, you will make a compromise. So you can't just be told by someone else, your pastor or the leaders or your parents, this is what we do because that's what we have been doing all these years. No, you need to know. You need to see from the Bible. You need to understand the logic, the flow of the Bible. What is the mission? Not the purpose, mission of the church. Unless you are clear about that, you will cave into pressure and waste a lot of resources and time. So you need to have clear biblical convictions, which is why we're looking at these things. Now, point number three, big point number three, big point number three. What then is the Great Commission all about? <coughs> so we defined <coughs> the word mission, and people confuse mission with purpose. We said do not confuse the two. Purpose is for eternity. Mission is a specific task. Right here, right now, because of finite resources and a limited time. And we said, for all these reasons, Matthew 28, still the great place to turn, still the right place to turn. And now we want to look at the Great Commission itself and look at the overview, the big view. What is the Great Commission all about? <coughs> so if you turn to Matthew 28 again, Here's a structure. Now, we'll unfold this next week. We're just going to give you, uh, see the big picture today. Verse 18. <coughs> just broadly speaking, three things. Verse 18. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. And uh, before, no, that's. 19. So 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. <coughs> now that's the claim. The big claim of Jesus. All authority, heaven and on earth, has been given to me. Verse 19 itself is the command. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always <coughs> to the end of the age. Now that's the comfort. So the structure, you need to really have this in your head, is we, have, we begin with the claim and it's sandwich, it's... <coughs> It begins with claim, ends with mighty comfort. I am with you to the end of the age. Precisely because the command in the middle is so daunting. We need such a mighty claim and an amazing comfort because the command is tremendous. What is the command? Verse 19, you see four verbs in English. Go, make disciples. It's matha uh, tusate in Greek, one word. Go, make disciples, baptizing them. and teaching them to observe. <coughs> now, in English, it's hard to see. But in Greek, it's very clear what the main point is. Make disciples, mathetusate. That's the main verb. That's the central verb. And and in Greek, go, baptize, teach. You can kind of see in English, ing ending verbs. These are participles, three participles. 
going, baptizing, teaching. Now, these three participles are modifying the central verb. How do you make disciples of all nations? By going, by baptizing, and by teaching, to, teaching them to observe. So making disciples, it comes down to that. That's the central verb. That's the central command of the Great Commission. And that's the mission of the church. The mission that Jesus has sent the church into the world to accomplish is making disciples. Disciples of Jesus, just as he first came to do when he called his disciples, I'll make you fishers of men. Come follow me. That's what he said. So, now we're going to look at what that really means next week and how so much of the Old Testament is assumed underneath all of that. But for now, I want to look at this fourth question. <coughs> so with third, why, right? Why the Great Commission? Now fourth. This may seem like an obvious question, but I think it's worth asking. So why is this? Why is this, the Great Commission, the mission of the church. We saw, I, I get the definition of the word mission, strategic importance of the Great Commission, what it is, what's, what it's basically about, but still, why is that the mission of the church, making disciples of all nations? What's the big deal of making disciples of all nations? Because a few weeks ago, when we talked about the church, we saw this quote by George Barna, who said, as the research data clearly shows, churches are not doing the job. If the local church is the hope of the world, then the world has no hope. So those who say today that the church is in deep trouble, they usually point to two things. They say, the church, look at the church, you're losing people. People are not coming to church anymore. You're irrelevant. You're losing people. All, you just have old people now, just like the way of Europe. All the young folks are not interested. You're losing people. And number two, people say, the church has lost its mission. They're doing non-essential things. What are you doing? You're confused, and you're losing people. So they propose, those who raise those two issues, they say, if the church is to win back the people, especially the young people, then you need to update your mission and make it more relevant. Make it more practical and relevant. Talk about the things that people want to hear. Otherwise, the church will just die the slow death. And it'll just, you don't have to fight the church. It'll just die itself. No one's going to come anymore. So what do we say to that? How do we respond to that? What about the first charge? That the church is losing people. Is that true? A couple of responses. The church, well, first of all, the church is not losing people. The church is not losing people. If you look at the rest of the world, the church is gaining people. It's because you are living here that it seems like we are losing people, especially in the West, especially around big cities. But if you look at the rest of the world, we are gaining more people. So if it seems like the church is losing people, it's perhaps not because the church is really losing people, but because the hand of God is moving away from the West to somewhere else. China. India, Africa, in which case we shouldn't be talking about changing the mission of the church to make it more relevant to people's lives, but we should be talking about Revelation 2.5 where we need to repent and consider from where we have fallen and go back to our first love, not changing the mission of the church. Now people come back and still say, but isn't it true? 
Okay, so worldwide, the church might be gaining more people, but isn't it true that at least in North America, in America, we are losing people? Is that true? Yes and no. Yes, in the sense that maybe the absolute numbers on, on like membership roles are going down. Those who identify themselves as church-going Christians, that number it might be going down. I wouldn't dispute that. But there is a profound sense in which we are not losing true, genuine, born-again Christians. What we are losing are nominal Christians. Christians in name only. Because for a, for a long time, uh, certainly not in this area, but for a long time, and even now, it paid to be Christians. There was a spiritual or cultural currency. If you want to meet people and do business, get uh, respect from the community, uh, because it was the culture was largely Christian, you had to go to church. It paid. It was to your advantage that you go to church. Everyone was a Christian back then. So it, you didn't really believe, you didn't really have a genuine relationship with Jesus, but everybody went to church. It was just a respectable thing to do. So you went to church. We are losing those people now because it, the culture now it no longer pays to be a Christian. Now you have to pay. Now there's a cost. So we're losing those people, people who say it no longer helps me to go to church. Now it's a cost. It's a liability. Now those people are losing. Th those people are going. So are we losing people? No, not really. We're losing nominal Christians, and that's a good thing. Nominal Christians, that's a good thing. The church is becoming leaner and healthier. And I think that's a good sign. No more cultural Christianity, nominal Christianity. Then what about the second charge? That the church has lost its mission. <coughs> so if you, the church must change or die, change the mission. People say that the church is making no impact. If you want to make a real difference in life, in your community, and attract people, especially young people, then do not bore them with Bible studies or expositional preaching. It's irrelevant. They don't like that. They say, what does that have to do with me? We want something practical. So church, volunteer at the local soup kitchens and help find people jobs and provide education. Do parenting seminars and how to ma manage your finances, raising kids, building, on, building your a marriage, a ha happy, healthy marriage. Focus more on community renewal, political and social activism, global activism, those things. That really makes a real difference in the lives of the people in the community and actually help the hurting people. Churches ought to be doing those things. Then people will come. Change the mission. Now, how do we respond to that? <coughs> now, there's a sense in which that those things are good points and we need to listen. And some of those things the church ought to be doing. We, need, we are part of the community. And we want to do good things, serve the poor, minister to them in their physical needs. Certainly, the church needs to be involved in a few of those things. But I'm asking, but what is the main responsibility? What should be the main thing? the main mission of the church. Three A, we must care for all human suffering, yes. But if we truly care for all human suffering, then we must care especially for eternal suffering. What is the greatest need of the world and what therefore is the most loving thing we can do? If we truly love them, we care for their greatest ultimate need. We care about their eternal suffering. Because again, we said in the beginning, a mission presupposes 
by finite resources and a limited time. In a world where resources are infinite and time is eternal, eternity of time, then you can do all these things, everything, because you're not constrained by anything. But in a world where time, resource, all these things are constrained so that when you do one thing, you cannot do other things, then you have to be strategic. What is the greatest need? What can we do? What is the main thing we need to be focused on? That's the mission of the church. And it, it is taking care of the people where they hurt the most, providing their ultimate need. So what is the greatest need of the world, the most loving thing we can do for them? Is it just in this fleeting, finite world of make them, you know, just live in this world that will soon pass away a uh, little bit more, with a little bit more comfort. You know, this whole world, as we have been seeing, as we see from the Bible, is in spiritual darkness. Veil has been put over their faces. They do not see their ultimate need. They're perishing. They will be damned in hell apart from Christ Jesus. Now, if we truly love them, in this journey called life, it's going to come to an end. This plane is going down. It's going to burn up. Are we to devote our time rearranging the deck chairs in this sinking boat or to provide lifeboat of the gospel so that they can be rescued? Nobody wants to see them suffer physically, psychologically, or in any way. We want to do what we can to help them but we want to do what can truly help them eternally, not just temporally. Hebrews 9.27 says this, and we believe these words. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Now that's what's coming to all humanity, everyone. <coughs> it is appointed for man to die once, Nobody's an exception, and after that comes judgment. That's the greatest need. We're all going to die. There is no exception, and then we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We want to prepare people for that because there is something worse than death. I mean, there is something worse than death. Death may be the last enemy, as the Bible says, but it's not the worst enemy. Because over and over again in Psalm 23, 1 Corinthians 15, Hebrews 13, 6, in these verses, what does it say? The Bible says, do not fear death. It's just your last enemy, but not the worst enemy. Psalm 23, 4, though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Don't fear death. 1 Corinthians 15, 55, O oh, death, where is your victory? Death. Where is your sting? Hebrews 13, 6. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? You see, everyone's afraid of death in this world. The Bible says, don't be afraid of death. It's just the last enemy, not the worst. But there is one thing that the Bible says, you need to be afraid of this. You need to fear this. And that is the one thing that the world is not afraid of which is a sign of spiritual death. Matthew 10.28. Turn to Matthew 10.28. So Bible says, you know, don't be afraid of death because there is something worse. Afraid, be afraid of that. And it's the opposite in the world. Matthew 10.28 says, <coughs> And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. See, that's the one thing that the world doesn't fear. They don't fear God. When God is the one who can kill not just the body, but your soul. But the world is so lost and so blind that they're afraid of those that can only kill the body and not their souls. And who's going to go and tell these things? The church. The one who has been entrusted the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Physical help 
community service. Again, I'm not, they're good things. We want to do them. But they don't compare to their ultimate need. The government agencies, the local community uh, services, they can do those things. But the world, no matter how well-intentioned, they cannot give them the gospel. The one thing that the world truly needs, that is the job, that is the mission of the church. We give them the gospel. We make them disciples of all nations. See, that's our central responsibility, our mission. And that mission will be what? It will expire when we go to heaven. This is the mission given to us right here, right now. In a world that is fleeting, passing away with finite resources and a limited time. That's why this is the mission of the church. It has to be done now, right here. <coughs> Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That's why the Father sent the Son into the world to give his life as a ransom so that we wouldn't have to face that. And that's why the Son, Jesus, is now sending us into the world to proclaim this good news and make disciples of all nations so that all who repent and turn to Jesus will be saved. And that is the greatest need of every human being, which is why the mission of the church is to do just that, proclaim the name of Jesus Christ and make disciples. See, the greatest need of humanity will never be met by social or political activism. They can't. It will only be met by the proclamation of the gospel, which is why the Great Commission is and will always be the mission of the church on earth. And when this world passes away, the mission will no longer be, and we will simply glorify God and enjoy Him. Mission is over, and now we will do what we were always meant to do what we were created to do, to glorify Him, to enjoy Him, to love one another. <coughs> now, if you go to places like India, actually, I was... <coughs> so when I went to India for the first time, obviously, you go to some very poor areas and you see the horrendous conditions and your heart goes out to them. And people are, oh, what can we do to help these people? And... And missionary Peck, she always reminds the teams, why do you feel that way? You feel compassion, that's good. I mean, you feel pity, that's good. But, but why? Because these people don't have clean water. They don't have money. They don't have this or that. Is that why your heart breaks for them? She says, don't. Your heart needs to be broken over the fact that they do not know Jesus. Not because they don't have water, clean water, or medicine, or education, or job, or poverty. All those things are superficial things. What our hearts really need to break over is the fact that they do not have the gospel. And I was told the same thing when I went to... <coughs> I felt the same thing when I went to Navajo, I think, Caleb, you went with me. You went every year, right? I mean, you go there, it's, it's kind of jarring because it's, it's not even, it's not a faraway country. It's, it's right here in America, reservation camp. They speak English and they're born and raised here, but the condition of living is very different. It's kind of shocking. Some stats, when I heard, shocked me. But 300,000 Navajos are Native Americans. 80% come from broken families, suffer from alcoholic or drug addiction. Suicide rate, some five times higher than the outside. Average life expectancy, 45 years old. Less than 2% Christians. And you would think, what do they really need? Yes, they need jobs, education, clean water, better environment, all those things. But 2% Christians? That's a UPG. B 
barely. What they need is the gospel. They need to be made disciples of Jesus Christ. Now here is a wonderful quote that I always go back to <coughs> whenever you face those temptations from the world and the cultural pressure. Change your mission. Church is being obsolete. I always go back to this because in 1933, <coughs> J. Gresham Machen, he wrote these words. In 1933, Economically, this was the time of the Great Depression. And theologically, this was the time of the great surge of liberalism. And the liberalism arose basically because of the same reasons that people are complaining today. Times are changing. The church needs to adapt. Otherwise, the churches will die. We have the rise of science and academics, and people are becoming smarter, more intelligent, and the church, you need to change, or you're going to die. Economically, theologically, pressed around in every corner. So, what is the church's responsibility? Machen tried to answer that question, that pressing question, and after nearly 90 years, it couldn't be more true and relevant. <laughs> he says this, the responsibility of the church in the new age is the same as its responsibility in every age. It is to testify that this world is lost in sin, that the span of human life, no, all the length of human history is an infinitesimal island in the awful depths of eternity, that there is a mysterious, holy, living God, creator of all, upholder of all, infinitely beyond all that he has revealed himself to us in his word and offered us communion with himself through Jesus Christ the Lord, that there is no other salvation for individuals or for nations save this, but that this salvation is full and free and that whoever possesses it has for himself and for all others to whom he may be the instrument of bringing it a treasure compared with which all the kingdoms of the earth no, all the wonders of the starry heavens are as the dust of the street. An unpopular message it is. Impractical message we are told, but it is the message of the Christian church. Neglect it and you will have destruction. Heed it and you will have life. That's the mission of the church. Making disciples of all nations. It cannot change. It will always be. Jesus gave the commission to the church 2,000 years ago, and until he comes back, that will remain the mission of the church. Proclamation of the gospel, making disciples of all nations, proclaiming to the world that they are lost in sin, that they are dead in sin, they are rebelling against God, and judgment awaits them, that they will all be destroyed by the wrath of God unless they repent. But God so loved them that he gave us the Son, who took away our sins by dying upon the cross on our behalf, and he defeated death and sin and Satan and rose again. Now he rules over all. He sits down at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And until he returns, he commands all men everywhere to repent and come to him. Then we will have forgiveness of sins, and we will be saved. We will have life, and he will come one last time to make all things right, to judge the living and the dead. That is the message that we proclaim to the world, and that is the mission of the church. And that will not change, because that alone is the only thing that can address the deepest need of humanity. And that is the most loving thing we can do, because it heals our deepest wound, only the gospel. The world lost in darkness will, of course, think that's impractical thing of the past that will scoff and mock that message. But if we would truly love them and serve them, we do not cave in to the pressure. We do not seek praise of men. We love them even as they trample, even as they kill and crucify the church. But we proclaim the message with which they can be 
brought into the kingdom of God because that is the mission of the church that Jesus has given to us. So until he comes back on that glorious day to take us home, we do not grow weary of proclaiming that good news. And we do not, we bear the reproach in the name of Christ Jesus, but we rejoice when anyone turns to the Lord. That is the mission. That is what, why we are here. That's the mission. And you can count on it because our God is a mighty and gracious God. This mission will be accomplished. It will be accomplished. He will not lose any one of his children. So people may laugh and say, you're on the wrong side of history, but we know who is on the wrong side of history because the author of history is going to come and he has called the end. We know how it's going to end. The kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of Christ's and he shall reign forever and ever. And all people from every tribe and language and nation will gather around the throne of the lamb that is slain and we will be waving palm branches and glorifying his name and worshiping him forever and ever. Until that day comes, while we are on earth in this fleeting world of finite resources and a limited time, let us give ourselves, devote ourselves to making disciples of all nations. <coughs> well, that <coughs> Whoa. <coughs> my voice is, what a perfect time to lose your voice because I'm done. <laughs> so we're done a little early today because I wanted to <coughs> look at the Great Commission, the actual content uh, next week. I didn't want to cram it just today and rush it. So let me pray and we'll call it a day. <coughs> Blessed Father, we are thankful that you have given us this tremendous task, this mission of the church, making disciples of all nations. Father, help us to be disciples and help us to make disciples. This is a tremendous command. Who is sufficient for these things? But Father, you have said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And if the one who said that also says, and I am with you, then Father, we're not afraid. This will be done. Only may we be faithful, may we be clear-minded and focused on this mission. Let us not cave into the pressures around us. But Father, may we be faithful and proclaim this good news because this is the only message that can save. And this is the message of genuine love and nothing else. And we know that this will be done. So Father, we thank you. Give us courage. Give us love. And may the church come around this mission of the church and stand bold and tall and convicted Oh, Father, we thank you. Be with us until we meet again. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.